What's going on, everybody? I am back for another Friday Live. It's amazing how these shows have continued to grow and how our guests just continue to flow in, get better, and uh, even more impactful. You know, today we've got a couple of really special ones coming in today, and I'm really excited to feature them for you. Uh, and as we're getting rolling here and waiting for them to jump in, um, I just wanted to really give you guys a little bit of perspective to some things that are happening in, through, and around our world right now. Super, super, super grateful for the growth of the Flip in the Lid podcast that we launched five weeks ago, four weeks ago, actually. Um, and yesterday, uh, we dropped the Brad Lee episode when he came down and spent an hour and 42 minutes with me or 47 minutes with me in my home studio. And um, this guy is just an incredible heart, incredible communicator. And the depth he was willing to go, the ownership he was willing to take. If you've not listened to that, please go check out. Uh, the link is in the bio for all the audio platforms. Or if you're on YouTube, just go search Flipping the Lid and Brian Bogert. Uh, having so much fun with this project. And it's, uh, it's been incredible. Today, uh, we are going to jump in right away. We've got an incredible guest with us. One that I actually met through my other live show with David Meltzer. That happens every Monday morning at 8.30 a.m. Pacific. And... You know what, like th this woman just came in and just showed heart, demonstrated who she was, showed up and was willing to be able to take her experiences, her life and her heart and bring them into the world in a really powerful way. And so the way she shows up in the world and how she's trying to support other people through the training and education, through the opportunities in uh, a fringe industry for many people in the world and using her own story to continue to propel her forward is just uh, one of the reasons I wanted her to be here with us today. So, um, I am not seeing uh, Devon here yet. It, she is here? Oh, cool. Okay, so we've got, uh, you're coming in under a different handle than I had last time. So here we go. Devon? Let's see, I'm trying to accept the request that you've put in here and it's not letting me add. There we go. D Williams, just D, just, just D, just, just D. D. Okay, perfect. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Good, I'm amazing. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thank you, Thank you for having me. I really appreciate I'm so you. I'm happy you're here. I just love how you show up in the world and I love what you're doing and I'd love to feature you and um, D, I love it. I, I think I had you on our show under a different handle last time. So it was okay. This is good. I'm happy you're here again, D. I'm excited. Um, I gave a little intro on who you are, but, but who are you in your words? Yeah. My name is D. Williams Audationaire. And um, I am someone who I feel is here to impact the world in a very positive way. I bring resilience. I show people how to to be resilient people, to have resolve, and to utilize that resolve in a positive manner. Um, I show people how to build businesses and brands and to just really be audacious in everything that they do. Like, don't do anything at a mediocre level. You have the power and the energy to impact the world in a great way. Even if it's the smallest thing you do, do it at the best level that you have because you only get a little bit of time here to play with anyway. You know what I'm saying? And then you're out of here. So what are you going to do right here? Go after it. Go do your best, you yeah. know? <laughs> I mean, I love the energy. I even like the intentional word choice, audacity, to live audaciously, yeah. right? Without apology, without exception. And, you know, it's really interesting because I think some people hear that and they start to say, well, that's not just like a check to be able to do whoever you are and treat people horribly and blah, blah. Like, it's not an unapologetic excuse to be a right. dick in society, right. Right. right? But but living audaciously is something that also society tries to check, I find, in many cases, right? Yeah. I mean, there's so much shame that exists in the world. Yeah. And there's two tracks to shame. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And when you show up in the arena, you're ready to go for battle. It's, who the fuck do you think you are? Exactly. Right? Like... <laughs> The bigger things I did, the more I felt the need to apologize and pull these things back. And so clearly the depth at which you speak about this, yeah. I can feel the energy, the passion, the conviction that only comes through contrast and experience. Yeah. So give me, sure. me a little bit of insight into your story and your journey and maybe a time when you weren't living audaciously and how you started to move through that to embody what you teach today. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So my story, so first of all, I know I look, so beautiful, so young and fresh right out of the womb. But like I was born in 77. <laughs> so I've been here for a very long time. So my story is so 
intense and vast. But a quick version, I will tell you that um, my world got rocked when I turned eight, right? I feel like from the age of eight to 21, 22, the worst things that could possibly happen to a person happened to me. I was raped at 11, had my child at 12, had another child at 15, living on my own mm. in a rat infested home with holes in the floors and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle curtains in my my apartment in the hood of Baltimore, you know, like just trying to figure out how to maneuver through life with people, in particular grown-ups who were telling me, hey, you can trust me, when in all actuality they had other ulterior motives. And just going through that and trying to figure out like how do I position myself um, in this world as, as someone who is more than what people think that I am. And the whole time I'm kind of going through these things, everyone's telling me you're not good enough. They're telling me, you know, you're, you're a teen mom. You don't have a high school diploma. Like, like, what do you think you're going to come out here and accomplish? You have nothing. You are no one. And I had to take that and do two things. One, utilize it as my fuel to keep pushing, right? And, and to say, mm, that may be their story for me, but that's not my story for me. But then two, I also had to um, rebuke, like work on myself, right? And, and, and not just rebuke what they say to me, but I had to change my thought process to define who I truly am. Is this true, right? Um, it, it, was a, it was a definitely a, a battle, right? And um, do I have a couple of minutes or I only got you a little don't, bit you of got, time? Like, okay. You got a few minutes, keep going. Oh, I'm here because okay. I want to feature so, you. Keep going, it's gold. Okay, so so I, I want to I wanna break it down into three phases because I told you I've been here for a little while. So when I was younger, I feel like my whole story was about me being raped all the time. I feel like every time something was happening to me, I was being raped, whether it was my stepfather or whether it was the babysitter or whether it was some guy who was telling me something you're, and he had all tears. Tell your memory was telling you that this was your truth always. Oh. Yeah. Always. So like I was I was I was raped by a cop, by a, a, a Baltimore police officer by gunpoint who told me that if I ever told anyone, he took my driver's license and he told me, me if physically I told ill. Him, that like makes me physically ill. No, he told me I he took the license. He said, if you tell anybody, I'm going to come kill everybody in your family. <sighs> so that was my first. I lost custody of my child. I didn't have parents at the time. So I literally tr could not finish high school. So I did not have a high school. I, I never got my high school diploma. Um, it was just that type of lifestyle, you know? And, um, and what I'll say, and during that time, through all of those negative things that were happening, there were key people in my life that were totally there. And I had to be open enough to accept them in the midst of everyone treating me in a different way. So for example, um, every day I would go to the library at Towson State University in, in Baltimore and I was trying to teach myself how to use Microsoft Office because I wanted to get off of welfare. My family did not agree with that. They said, why would you get off of welfare when you're getting everything for free? And I felt mm -hmm. like I needed so much more. So I said, no, I'm going to get off of welfare. I'm going to get a job. So I go and I get this job. I try to go get a job and they tell me you're not smart enough. You don't know how to use Microsoft. So I go to the library, I start reading books, I start testing the computer. The lady at the library sees me one day with my children and she says, how old are you? And I say, like, I'm 16, you know? And she's like, are these your kids? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, we're your parents. And I was like, I don't have any parents. And she said, these kids are hungry. When is the last time you fed them? And I said, like, I've been here all day. I don't have a lot of money, you know? She's like looking at me, she gives them some crackers and she says, come back up here tomorrow. And I was thinking in my mind, there's no way I'm going back up there tomorrow. This lady is gonna take my kids. She's gonna have Child Protective Services waiting on me. I'm young, I'm not in school. I don't have any parents. I'm living on my own. She's gonna take my world. So I fought with that idea the whole way home. And the next day I woke up and it was just a pattern to go to that library and to fix my life. And I went, and when I got there, they had a PlayStation ready for my kids in the corner. 
Um, they had food prepared for the entire day. They had a, a station set up for me to read the books for Microsoft and to use me chills right now. Microsoft. And they helped me every month for like three months. Every week I would take the test and come back. I failed the test. They're like, okay, what did you fail? And then we would practice until I won, you know, until I finally passed the test. And they were like my backbone. It took a lot for me to trust them and, and to even think that they were on my side. Another thing, the drug dealer that was, it was a drug dealer on the block, on the street that I was living on. I'm walking down the street with my kids with the stroller. He looks at me and he said, hey, what's your name? And I told him my name. He said, how old are you? And I said, I'm 16. And he said, these are kids? And I said, yeah. He said, where you live at? And I said, I live over in the Brickstone over there. And he said, over there on, on Myrtle? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, take me to your house right now. Now, at this point, I had already been sexually abused. So a smart person yeah. would have said, hell no. <laughs> 16-year-old woman with two little kids. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. Yeah. It was something about him that said, let him go. So I said, okay. So I took him upstairs. He walked into my house. He walked through my entire house and inspected it like he was the fire inspector. And then he looked at me and he said, you don't have a refrigerator. I said, no, I don't. He said, you don't have a stove. I said, I don't. He said, you don't have any curtains. He's like, how long have you been living here? You don't have a bed. It's like four months and, you know, like just telling him my story. And he just looked at me and he's like, are you 16? I say, yes. So he goes in his pocket. He pulls out a knot of money, $500. That was a massive amount of money for me. He's like, go down to Lexington Market. Go get you and the kids something to eat. So I ran downstairs to the neighbors below me and I said, can I get some food and y'all put it in my refrigerator? And they say, yeah. And I said, okay, cool. I'm going to go down to the market. So I took my kids. He said, come back in two hours. When I came back in two hours, he had a truck sitting out front of my house, outside of my house. He had a bassinet for my, my son. He had a box ring and mattress for me. He had these milk crates, these like gray milk crates from back in the day. And um, he bought a black and white TV and a toaster oven. He's like, um, I'm going to give you a little bit more money. He's like, I don't even know how you're doing this right now. He said, but the only thing I could say, oh, and he bought the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle blankets. He put the blankets up on the windows. He laid the crates down, put the black and white TV in, plugged it in, laid the box spring, the mattress. He said, here's a couple of hundred dollars to go get you some sheets. Um, here's a bassinet for your baby. My son was one pound, 13 ounces when he was born. So when I brought him home, he was only four pounds. So he couldn't even stay in the bassinet. He was in like a little car seat, right? And so he said, um, I'm going to tell you something. I never want you to forget this. You're safe on this block. I'm not going to let anybody on this block ever hurt you or your kids ever. You can run through here freely. This is your world. If anybody touches you, you come and see me. I was safe on that block while I lived there. And that was the type of life that I had. So while all of these negative things were coming at me consistently, always to the point where I was like, I hate people. I hate grownups. They're all liars. They're all trying to hurt me. Every now and then, my energy would say, I think this person's a good person. Just give them a chance. I think this person's a good person. Just give them a chance. And the once few times that I did do that, it was people that you would never expect, like the drug dealer or the, the old lady at the library who, you know, it, it was just, and, and it turned me into someone different because I was angry. I was angry about my mom. I was angry from being raped. I was angry for being by myself. I was angry because I didn't feel protected. And the whole time, the God, the universe, the, the significant power was literally planting these little seeds to say, you know what? She's got a bigger vision. I got something else planned for her. If I just put these few people in front of her, then everything will be okay. One more minute, I promise, and I'll give you your show hey, back. Hey, girl, you're good. Keep going. Seriously. Well, we're going to have you back on a longer form show for sure. I want to take this conversation deeper, but you've got the time. You're, you're good. During this time when all of these things were happening, I'm going to cry. I don't want to cry. <laughs> During these times when all these things were happening, so the drug dealer left and, and I was safe, but I was living in the hood. And I'm going to tell y'all, if y'all have ever been to Baltimore or Myrtle Avenue, if you go there now, it, you can tell, you'll be able to see what I look, where I live. And um, 
And so there were nights that I would wake up and there would be rats on my chest, mm. like real living rats. Like I would be in my dreams saying to myself, wake up, wake up, wake up. And in my dreams saying, why should I be waking up? Wake up right now. And when I wake up, a rat is like literally sitting on my face or I look to the left and one is on my baby. And I'm like trying to fling the rats off. And then I wake up and the rats are going up the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle blankets. Not because I'm dirty, but because I live in the hood, right? I live where they hang out. And, and this was my life. Yeah. Like, you know, the lights getting turned off and us living on candles. The rats ate through my baby's bottles. I didn't have a refrigerator for a long time. I put them out on the, the, um, the uh, put them on the, we had the staircase yeah. in the back, you know. Yeah. I put them out there to stay cold. I came in, my baby was crying. I go to get it, they had bitten through the bottle. So like, I was forced, I was like, all of these things were happening to me and everybody was against me, but my goal was to keep moving forward. I didn't want to be a statistic, even though I was, I didn't know it. I, I didn't want to be seen as somebody who would give up. I felt like I was here to do so much more, even though everything around me said that I wasn't, I felt like I was. And I felt like I needed to stay true to that thought process. And I did. And now you get to see this version of me <laughs> as the, you know. <laughs> Gee, there is so much beauty, so much wisdom in all of the elements of what you just talked about. I'm going to highlight a couple because I really want to honor you uh, and, and use it also to make sure that the lesson is completely heard. Um, truly. Uh, you navigated that whole bit very, very gracefully. And, you know, it's really interesting because we, we all want to feel safe and we all want to feel protected. We all want to feel seen and understood and we all want to feel connected. Yeah. But the second we protect ourselves, we guarantee that we're not going to be seen and understood and we're not going to be connected. Right. And there, there are times when, you know, I teach this concept of soft front and strong spine, right? You need to know who you are. You need to know your conviction, your heart, your, your philosophy, your, your soul, your intent, your everything, your boundaries, like what you're willing to accept, what you're not willing to accept, the narratives that are yours, the narratives that aren't yours. Like if you know all that stuff and you've done the work, you can, you can exist exposed with a strong spine because you're unwavering. Right. Yeah. But to have a soft front means to be open, right? Because if somebody's going to come to you in the human experience, they don't want to lay their head down on a chest piece of armor, right? But they also are not going to receive you for who you are if you're carrying it. And what you surrendered in those moments was that you were trusting that you were being protected and promoted, and you were trusting the depth of what you felt you needed in moments of desperation, where even though everything in your world told you you weren't safe, you had people who saw you because of the action you took. Mm -hmm. Karma is the same Sanskrit word that comes from the Sanskrit definition of karma is action, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the reality of it is I don't mean this like do, 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 don't learn how to be like, no, no, there's like a whole different thing we could go on of like people overact. <laughs> but what I want to be really clear on is that you, from the time that you started telling that story in the age, the awareness, the understanding you had in yourself, you took actions to break the patterns from your past. Yeah. And you took actions to ensure the safety of your future. Yeah. And be because you took actions that were in alignment with who you were and who you were becoming, the who's that you needed in your world landed there in the times that you needed them. And you allowed yourself to receive it. And so I know that we're out of time for today. I mean it when I say it. I want to get you scheduled for our longer form podcast because I really want to unpack your story in more depth, more context. Yeah. Because there is so many lessons just in the way that you even exist in who you are today. Uh, as we wrap this segment, though, my friend, I just want to say thank you for showing up the way you did today and being willing to share to the depth that you did. Um, I believe that true strength hides behind vulnerability. And what you just demonstrated for us is not just the strength, but the heart that exists within you. And so for that, I want to say thank you. How can... Just give give a little quick on, on what you actually do in the world and how people can find you because it, it, truly, I want everybody to know who you are. Yes. I, so I help people start staffing businesses. I help people build businesses and brands for the most part. So you can find me at staffingpreneursacademy.com if you're interested in starting a staffing business. We turn the average underdog like myself into auditioners. Uh, so amazing people. 
Um, also, if you are looking to start a coaching brand or if you're looking to get more coaching and learning, you can go to reskillify.com. I'm the founder of that tech platform. And then also, if you're looking to tap into the cannabis industry, we also have the Cannabis Job Board, which is kind of like an indeed for the cannabis industry, but 10 times better. Don't tell them I told you. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we love impacting lives through your life, your career, through business. That's everything that I do is I show resilience. I show people how to be resilient and how to establish strong resolve to achieve their life goals, their career goals, and their business goals. And I just want to say thank you all for allowing me to tell my story. I apologize for crying. I'm trying to get through this without the Never tears. Never apologize it's, for crying, it, my friend. It is, it is real. <laughs> and you... You're beautiful with tears, so just stop. Never apologize for that. That's what the world tells us. They try to convince us we can't feel. Fuck that. I appreciate human connection, that. Without emotion isn't human connection, my friend, and you connect, I, so let it flow. I appreciate that. I thank y'all. I really appreciate y'all for allowing me to be on here, and I'm excited about coming back. Good luck to everybody out there. Like, y'all have what it takes to do whatever it is you're looking to do. You have the energy. You have the goals. You have the drive, you have the desire, you can do it. You just got to make up your yeah. mind. I'm just going to throw that in there. All right, bye. <laughs> Gee, much love. We will talk again soon. Thank you so much. I just, I love it. Continue pouring into the world. We need more people pulling in the same place. Collective impact, that's what it's all about. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. Love y'all. <laughs> Take care. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. All righty. Well, obviously, you can all see why I gave her some additional time. The depth of that story was insane. And so, Nick, I know you're here, and I'm just going to say thank you for your patience.